morning, we're going to finish off Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to finish off that chapter. We've been here for three weeks. Um, this is our third week. And I wanted to take this chapter slowly because there's a lot of good nuggets in here, a lot of good, um, just a lot of great stuff. And, and I still think that I wasn't able to cover all of it. There's more that could be covered. I could spend a lot more weeks here, many more weeks here in this chapter. But, um, but I've titled today's message, A Tough But Wonderful Warning. Many of you probably know that the Bible is full of hard and challenging passages. But those passages are there to help us grasp a fuller understanding of the entire, the whole counsel of God. If we skip over those challenging passages, it's very likely that we'll become biblically impaired. We'll become biblically impoverished. And when our Bible reading is lacking, when it's deficient, our growth in godliness will also be negatively affected. In order to avoid this, we must seek to understand the Bible's difficult parts by referencing them to the clearer parts. In other words, Scripture ought to be interpreted by Scripture. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Scripture ought to be interpreted by Scripture. The more believers properly do this, uncomfortable passages will become easier to understand, accept, and to trust. And it's important to be to know this, to be aware of this, especially as we finish off this chapter, because today's passage will require, require this kind of approach. And so with this last section of chapter 10, the author of Hebrews will issue a sober, sobering and haunting warning to avoid deliberate sin. This warning will then be followed up with an important word of encouragement meant to drive believers toward faithfulness. He does this to show us that the perils of abandoning the faith are too costly to bear. That's what I hope this message will show you by the time you leave here today is that a true Christian not only, not only lives a life of obedience to God, but also endures and is faithful in the midst of persecution. The one who places his faith in Christ, his or her faith in Christ, will ultimately have a reason for confidence in the promise of hope at his return. And so before we begin reading, let's come before the Lord and ask him to bless us this morning. Heavenly Father, we're just so amazed at the wonderful things that you've blessed us with, the wonderful things that you've given us. So we pray that you will continue to do that by filling this room with your spirit, Lord, by opening up our hearts, our minds, so that we may hear you, so that we may understand the words that we're going to be reading today, and that the nuggets of truth that will be presented will be implanted deeply into their proper places. Pray we'll bless those that are, are watching this live or that will be watching the recording later on. You will bless them too, Lord, that you will change their lives, that you will show them your glory and your beauty and your grace and your mercy. Lord, we look forward to uh, what you have in store for us today. Love you and praise you. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, 
Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 10. I'll be picking up in verse 26. And the word of God says, For if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire about to consume the adversaries. Anyone who disregarded the law of Moses died without mercy based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who has trampled on the Son of God? Who has regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and who has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know that the one, for we know the one who, said, who has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is terrifying. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, in these verses that we just read, the writer issues a grim warning about ignoring everything that he had just previously said in verses 19 through 25. Verse 26 is a continuation of that section. That's why it begins with the word for. Now, even though it does seem more like a warning, you can also see this as an exhortation, albeit a solemn one. Well, clearly we see that it's, been, it's written to believers, and it also seems to follow in sequence with the other ex exhortations that we've seen so far throughout this letter, in chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, if this is the case, here's what the sequence, that sequence looks like. The believer who begins to drift from the word, and that was mentioned in chapter 2, will soon start to doubt the word. And that was mentioned in chapter 3 and 4. Soon he will become dull towards the word. We covered that in chapter 5 and 6. And become lazy in his spiritual life. This will, re will, will result in disregarding the word, which is the theme of this exhortation. Now, the writer structures the first part, just the first part of verse 26, to emphasize a specific point, which is this. Do not remain in sin. The warning against sinning deliberately doesn't mean that all sin we commit as believers nullifies Jesus' sacrifice for us. Rather, it's an attitude that leads to repeated disobedience. That attitude reflects that you've essentially rejected the gospel and are willingly walking the path that leads to destruction. Now, in a sense, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sins because you rejected the only valid sacrifice and turned your back on the only one who can justify you before God. So truth is, there's no forgiveness for a person who has made that decision. So in case you're wondering what the author means by receiving the knowledge of truth, well, let me tell you. This refers to those who hear and know the gospel and still sin deliberately and defiantly reject it. Even though they understand its truthfulness. The author also has in mind those who at one time embraced the Christian faith, but have, but have since 
apostatized. At one time, they claimed to be believers. And this is the, if you don't know what apostatized, uh, an ap- apostatized means, let me explain it. At one time, they claimed to be believers, but the profession proved false. Rather than enduring in the faith, they abandoned it, abandoned it in order to pursue sin. And so you see, there can be no forgiveness for those who apostatize. Jesus warns uh, about such people in Matthew chapter 13. He spoke of the gospel seed falling in shallow soil and showing immediate signs of life, but dying out when persecution came. The initial sign of life doesn't describe regeneration, only spiritual interest. The regenerated life, the born-again life, by contrast, by contrast, is transformed, bears new fruit, and has a lasting eternal impact. This parallel, or this parable, like Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, verse 26 in our chapter, is it's a sobering reminder that Right now, hell is full of people who have a clear understanding of the gospel, but never bowed the knee to Christ as king. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, the apostle John also warns us that, that there will be those who identify with God's people, but eventually abandon his church. So the warning there, and also the Bible can't be any more clear, those who go on sinning willfully and deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth will not find forgiveness in the end. Verse 28 tells us that what's in store for those who go on sinning deliberately, instead of receiving merciful forgiveness for their sins, they receive justice for them. They await God's coming, coming judgment, because they have rejected the Son. Instead of aligning with God's people, the church, they have chosen to identify with its adversaries. The judgment here refers to God's final judgment when he will condemn all of his enemies once and for all. And so the language of verse 27 also recalls Isaiah chapter 26, verse 11, which details a day God will judge his adversaries with fire. And as we'll see in a later verse, our God is a consuming fire. That's what he is. And so the point is this. Again, I didn't make myself clear before. Those who reject Christ make themselves enemies of God and will be subject to his wrath. This ought to always be a sobering reminder. And if you're out there and aren't a believer... You aren't a child of God. You're not born again. That's what, that's what is in store if you don't repent of your sins and allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Well, in verses 28 to 31, the author of Hebrews continues his argument by appealing to the Old Testament by once again comparing, or he compares the Mosaic law with the new covenant. This regarding the law of Moses primarily refers to breaking the first commandment, which forbids idolatry. The phrase is shorthand for total rejection of the whole of the entire Old Testament law that God gave to Israel through Moses. And so those who disregard the law of Moses forfeit the right to become children of 
of Israel. Disregarding the law of Moses then should not be thought of in terms of merely ignoring the law. It refers to an egregious and high-handed rebellion against God himself. Thus, for those who violated the law in this manner, based on the witness of two or three people, were put to death without mercy. This punishment for committing idolatry makes the words of Hebrews chapter, or verse 29 here in this chapter that much more severe. That verse, verse 29, shows us that those who trample the Son of God regard as profane the blood of the covenant and outrage the Holy Spirit will have an even more severe punishment than that found in the Old Testament. Those who disregarded the law of Moses received an earthly punishment. Those who disregard the revelation of Jesus Christ receive, they receive a worse punishment. The author of Hebrews employs a rhetorical question to demonstrate just how seriously apostasy will be judged. The offense is threefold. Number one, trampling underfoot the Son of God. Number two, regarding as profane the blood of the covenant. And number three, insulting the Holy Spirit. The first offense, trampling underfoot the Son of God, describes those who reject the identity of Christ. Jesus extrapolates this idea in John chapter 14 when he says that if a person rejects the Son, he rejects the Father. This here, ladies and gentlemen, this here is a crucial, it's a crucial point. See, those who reject the divinity of Christ and His Sonship reject the Father and no longer have a sacrifice for sins. You get that? Let me repeat that for those that are watching. Those who reject the divinity of Christ and His Sonship reject the Father and no longer have a sacrifice for sins. Let that sink in. A second offense regarding as profane the blood of the covenant evokes the Old Testament and the respect for holy things in the tabernacle and the temple. To touch any holy object without being purified was to invite instant destruction. And so Hebrews, this verse here, verse 29, shows treating the blood of the covenant, that is the blood of the covenant sacrifice, Jesus Christ, like if it was a like if it was profane, is even more egregious than denigrating or belittling the holy objects in the temple. To treat the blood of the covenant as profane essentially means not to believe that the blood of Christ can affect purification for sins. We have already seen the centrality and power of his blood throughout this letter. We've seen it in chapter 9, in verses 12, 14. We've seen it in verses 25 there, in verse 26 in chapter 9, and also in chapter 10, verse 19. And so verse 29 is no different. We're told that the blood of the covenant sanctifies us. And so, again, to disregard Christ's blood is to spurn, is to reject, is to say, you know what? Nah, it doesn't do that. It's to spurn the purification that it accomplishes. The third offense is insulting the spirit of grace. It refers to disparaging the Holy Spirit 
which is equivalent of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 12. Because the Father gives the Holy Spirit through Jesus to comfort and help believers, those who reject Jesus also reject the Spirit. Those who apostatize essentially make themselves an enemy of the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit is insulted by those who transgress against Christ. Christ. The Holy Spirit, my friends, is in case you know there's the third person of our triune God. The third person. It's a he, not an it. And if you allow him to, he'll make his home in you and fill you, show you things. Wonderful, beautiful things. Again, only if you confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Well, in verse 30, the author quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 35 and 36. Moses spoke those words just before the Israelites entered the promised land. The author uses these citations to anchor his argument that those who sin deliberately deserve worse punishment. The quotations leave little doubt that God will indeed judge those who reject him. See, his divine vengeance and justice await those who trample the Son, regard his blood, his blood as profane, and insult the Spirit. But in all reality, though, earthly justice, it's, they're often inadequate. But the Lord's justice will be perfectly administered. We must, not fail, we must not fall into his hands the way Israel did. This here should strike fear into the hearts of those who disregard, for those who have rejected Christ. God's final judgment is a matter of eternal horror. So we mustn't mess around with God. We must see Him for who He truly is. Apostasy is no game to be played. It truly is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The very God who is, as chapter 12, verse 29, will soon tell us, a consuming fire. And so, if you're out there, let me again warn you. If you reject the Son, you have every reason to fear the Father. Let me also say this. In stating this exhortation, in stating that this exhortation applies to believers today, but it doesn't involve, but that it doesn't involve loss of salvation, I want to be clear. I'm in no way suggesting that, cha that chastising is unimportant. On the contrary, it is important that every Christian obey God and please the Father in all things. Dr. William Culbertson, the late president of Moody Bible Institute, used to warn us about the sad consequences of forgiven sins. God forgave David's sin, sins, but 2 Samuel chapter 12 tells us that David suffered the sad consequences for years afterwards. In fact, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9 says that David had despised the Lord's command. And because he did that, God 
dealt with him. And so, what then? What then should a believer do who has drifted away into spiritual doubt and dullness and is deliberately despising God's word? Maybe this applies to you. Maybe this is you right now, today. You're wondering, what am I supposed to do now? I've drifted away, and I've I have a bunch of doubt. I feel dull. Well, let me tell you, you should turn to God for mercy and forgiveness. There's no other sacrifice for sin, but the sacrifice Christ made is sufficient for all your sins. It's a fearful thing, my friends, to fall into the Lord's hands for chastising or chastening. But it's a wonderful thing to fall into his hands for cleansing and restoration. David in David in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 13 said, "Let me fall into the Lord's hands because his mercies are very great." So now that we've covered the warning, the last part that we'll be reading will be we'll, we'll cover that we'll cover will continue to encourage readers to persevere. So let's pick up in verse 32. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 32. Remember the earlier days when after you had been enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions. And other times, you were companions to those who were treated that way. For you sympathized with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confiscation of your possessions. Because you knew that, that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. So don't throw away your confession, your confidence, which has, which has a great reward. For you need endurance, so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what was promised. For yet, in a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. So far, the author has encouraged this house church, this group of Jewish believers. He's encouraged them. He's warned them. And as we've just seen he now exhorts them to endure whatever comes their way. In verses 32 to 34, the author calls on these believers to remember their earlier days. Those early days when they first came to believe. Those early years just after their conversion. He wants them to remember their strong zeal for the Lord and how they handled the difficulties they experienced on the account of following Christ in a world that opposed him, that rejected him. They endured sufferings for their faith. And so now that they had, or that they had endured those sufferings, they can endure suffering in their present situation. At that time, they were publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. This means that they weren't ashamed to make their faith in Jesus public and were insulted and mistreated when they did. They chose to identify with Christ in a fallen world. And so society shamed them. Nowadays, we call that 
canceled. As believers were canceled. Not only did they receive this kind of abuse themselves, but they also chose to identify with others that are, were also going through the same reproach. And so as Christians, my brothers and sisters, we must be willing to endure the same persecution, identifying with Jesus in a world that doesn't want him as king will mean becoming victims of verbal abuse, mockery, and shame in the public square. Those who stand with Christ cannot be those who assimilate with the winds of culture. Verse 34 further develops the experience of these Christians, of these particular Christians he's writing to in their earlier days. Again, they, I mentioned this already, they had sympathy for those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. Those in prison refers to Christians who had been incarcerated for their faith. In the early days of their faith, these Christians showed tender compassion to their brothers and sisters in chains. Though they were not in prison themselves, they chose to identify with those who were persecuted in that way. Additionally, they endured the plundering of their property with joy. What's remarkable isn't that they lost their possessions because they identified with Jesus, but because they responded with joy with, uh, to such persecution. Why were, they were why were they able to respond in such a remarkable way? Because they knew they had a better and enduring possession. They knew a heavenly kingdom with heavenly possessions awaited those who rejoiced when persecuted. These believers understood that better possessions were in store for those who persevered in the midst of persecution. And so they continued to align with Christ, even when it cost them in earthly matters. Moreover, they knew the possession that awaited them was enduring. They knew their possession in heaven was an everlasting possession that would not be taken away from them and it would never expire, fade away, or be taken from them. Stolen. This knowledge helped them to endure early in their faith. And so the author exhorts his readers to remember those days to help them endure in their present circumstances. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it's possible that one day we may lose everything for the sake of Christ. But always keep in mind in an eternal, in an, in an eternal sense, we lose nothing. We may lose possessions. We may lose friends, family, and the comforts of this life. But we have a better and abiding possession waiting for us in our heavenly city. As with believers in the book of Hebrews, what we gain when we endure persecution can never, ever, ever be taken away from us. And so the last five verses of this chapter reminded those early believers of the confidence they now possess in Christ, as well as the eternal reward that belongs to them if they continued to endure the author then again highlights this reality in verse 35. To abandon the faith is to throw away the confidence that belongs to Christians to reproach the throne of God or to approach the throne of God. If the readers apostatize, they will lose that confidence and the great reward of eternal life that comes with it. The following verse, verse 36 tells us of our need for endurance. 
and the promised inheritance that awaits those who persevere. We as Christians, as believers, we demonstrate our endurance in the faith if we do the will of God. As long as we obey the Lord and faithfully do His will, we will receive the eternal inheritance that has promised, that has been promised to us, has been promised to believers. This promise may not be fulfilled in our lifetimes, but it will be fulfilled soon, as the next verses indicate. So our inheritance isn't an earthly inheritance as much as some of these prosperity preachers will tell you. It isn't in earthly, in, in earthly possessions, and it's not an earthly inheritance. It's a heavenly inheritance, a promise that will be fulfilled at the end times. The author quotes then from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, to support this reality. There in Habakkuk, it speaks of God's coming judgment on, on Judah for refusing to do the will of God. The author mentions this point to the final, uh, the author mentions this to point to the final judgment that's coming at Christ's return. In other words, Habakkuk speak of God's coming, which the author of Hebrews sees fulfilled in the future coming of Christ. My friends, he's coming soon. He's coming soon. And so we must continue to do the will of God and not draw back in our faith. As verse 30, 38 indicates, the Lord will find no pleasure in us when he returns if we don't go on living by faith. In the final verse, the author expresses his utmost confidence in his readers by reminding them of their identity and strength as God's people. He proclaims they will not draw back in their faith and thus will prove their allegiance to Christ until the very end. Destruction awaits those who draw back, who do draw back, but not on those who press on and persevere and preserve their souls. They will obtain the life promised to those who endure in every sense of the word. They will be saved. Church, this is what it means to be a follower of Christ. These warnings in these, these warning uh, passages keep the believer from spiritual complacency. Before learning and uh, before learning from and appreciating the faithful example, examples the author identifies in Hebrews chapter in the next chapter, in chapter 11, these believers must be reminded to persevere in the faith before they can associate themselves with those that are listed in the next chapter. They must make every effort not to draw away, not to fall back or draw back from Christ. And it's this, with this final warning, the author reminds all believers to hold true to the faith and thus associate with the saints throughout the centuries. There's a sign that's posted near a convent that reads, absolutely no trespassing. Violators will be persecuted to the full extent of the law. That's a sign by the Sisters of Mercy. The passage that we just read hits many people the same way. I mean, here we've been reading of our faithful and merciful high priest, Jesus Christ, who was touched with the same feelings with we wrestle with and tempted by the same things that tempt us. 
We've been reading that we can come boldly unto his throne of grace and that the veil has been ripped. It's been removed, given us access to the very holy of holies of the goodness and grace of God. And then we come to this part of chapter 10 where we read that if we sin willfully, there's, more, there's no more sacrifice for sins. That if we sin, we trample underfoot the Son of God and that it's a terrible thing, it's a terrible, ter- fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So, it seems that this passage, upon first reading, to be somewhat contradictory to the entire spirit of the rest of the letter here. But it's not. You see, warnings can affect people two two ways. They can either be intimidating or they can be inviting. Go to Makaha, the island of Hawaii, and you'll find a sign reading, warning, heavy surf. Now, if you're a parent and you brought your little kids to the beach, this sign would be intimidating. But if you're a surfer and you brought your surfboard, this sign would be inviting. Throughout church history, Satan has used this passage before us to intimidate the hearts of people like you and me. Indeed, Satan has and will use the word for his purposes. Did God really say you can't eat of the tree of the garden? He asked Eve, implying God's command was questionable. That God's command was of questionable motive. Jump off the temple, he taunted Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Isn't it written that God will take care of you, he said? Misquoting Psalm, Psalm chapter 91. Truly, Satan has misused the word to cause confusion and consternation in the lives of those who love the Lord. But wait a minute. The epistle to the Hebrews was written to Jewish believers who were being pulled back to temple worship and, and the sacrificial system. The warning is this. The warning is this to them. If you return to the temple and offer sacrifices for your sins, you're missing the point totally because the price was paid completely when Jesus died in your place. There are no more sacrifices that can be, need be, or should be offered. The way is open. The work is complete. It's done. Going to confession, getting rebaptized, making a promise, or signing a pledge will not make you right with God. None of these sacrifices will do any more than the sacrifice of bulls, rams, or goats. You can't add to what Jesus did on the cross by promise-keeping, confessing, working, or giving. So don't fall into that mindset. For if you do, you tread on what the Lord has already done. Thus, contrary to many well-intentioned sermons that have been preached, about these verses that we covered, verses 26 through 39. It's not so much in reference to backsliding as it is to back turning, turning one's back on what Jesus did on our behalf. Certainly, this is what the writer intended because the truth is every one of us fails Every one of us is increasingly aware of our shortcomings. The closer 
we get to the Lord, the more deeper we become more intimate with him, the more he reveals himself to us. We start to see how still, even though we're saved, how sinful we are. Every one of us can easily relate to Paul when he said, I am the chief of sinners. Jesus died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. For the whole world. Not just for certain people, not just for a group of people, but for the whole world. How dare we then say that what he did on the cross is insufficient or inadequate? How dare we trample the body of Christ? If you want to see the anger of the Father, say that what Jesus did at Calvary is inadequate without your additional efforts. The author is right. It's a terrible thing to fall into the nail-pierced hands of the living God if we fall on them with any sacrifices of our own, suggesting that his was not enough. So in a sense, going back to that sign that, about, the, about the surfers, so in a sense, we're surfers. Gang, the warning of Hebrews chapter 10 isn't intimidating. It's inviting. It's great news. You mean your warning, Father, is not to go back to self-effort, to religious activities, or try to earn your favor? You mean I'm free to just remember what you've done and to celebrate my salvation? Wonderful, great, amazing. The warning here in chapter 10 doesn't cause me to be intimidated. And I hope that it doesn't cause you to be intimidated. Rather, I hope that, as it does for me, that it it invites me. It invites you to keep your walk simple and to enjoy your salvation. There is no more sacrifice for sins. Jesus has done it all. Surf's up so boldly enter into the waters. So right now, if if you've been walking or have turned your back on the Lord and have been living a disobedient lifestyle for no matter how long, how short it's been, come back to the Lord. Come back to the Lord and He will forgive you. He understands. He gets you. He knows. He knows that you've fallen for the millionth time. He knows that you've turned your back on him for the millionth time. But he's still there. And he still wants you to come to him. He will never get tired of hearing you say, I'm sorry, Lord. I messed up. Help me. Forgive me and help me. And for the millionth time, he will. And he will do it for the millionth and one time. Million and two, two million, three million times, whatever it is. He will forgive you. Come to him if you've turned your back.
Maybe some of you watching who have never given your life over, have never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ, have never asked him to forgive you of your sins. You know, and you understand the gospel. You know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He wants to forgive you. And all you got to do is freely accept him. Admit you're a sinner and accept him and believe that God raised him from the dead and confess him as your Lord and Savior. You know that, you know the message, and yet, I don't know, it's always been hard for you. It's always been challenging because of this or because of that or because of, you know, whatever's going on in your life. Look to the cross. Look to Jesus. He has an eternal plan for you. All you got to do is say yes and reach out to him. Don't delay any further. His coming may happen at any moment. And like we just read here today, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Don't be among those. Be among those that he calls his child. He calls to come to him and dine with him. So if you're ready for your life to be eternally changed, for your world, your view, everything to be completely changed, I want you to bow your head, close your eyes with all your heart, with all sincerity. Come to the cross and pray this. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you right now to forgive me. I truly believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now I repent from those sins and confess you as my Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Friends, if you prayed that, I want to welcome you into the family of God. If you don't know what to do next, just give me a call. I'll help you in your next steps of your new Christian walk. Maybe help you find a church wherever you may be. You know, if you need prayer, if you need more, need to talk more, reach out to me. If you're here locally in El Paso, we want to invite you to come check us out here. At 4242 Hondo Pass Drive, Northeast El Paso, right at, you know, the intersection of uh, Hondo Pass and Gateway South. We'll open our doors to you, welcome you in. And like I said, I'm, as you've just seen, I'm not a flashy person. I'm not an exciting person. And I sometimes m- mumble a lot and you know, I lose my train of thought. I'm not you know, like some of these well-known, famous pastors, teachers. I don't want to be. I just want to be me. But one thing I will do is, and 
will I strive to do is to teach you the word of God. We'll come here, leave here more knowledgeable. So again, join us here um, on Sundays, 10 a.m. If you're here locally, uh, I want to thank you for being with us this week. I hope this message touched you personally, has really made you think about a lot of things. And if it has, come to the Lord. He will hear you out. Uh, We will see you next week as we uh, start to wrap up Hebrews. We hope you have a great week. We love you. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.